My, my, we're two minutes late. Not our fault. Today I'm going to remind you of this week's assignment, which is the second film essay, which comes with a set of instructions that include a different kind of request. Then I'm going to go back to the scenes that I showed in class on Monday to analyze how the premise of the film was organized. The diner where we see Louise, the house where we see Thelma, both of their homes when they're packing and then the beginning of their trip set the baseline, right? Normally, a film, a traditional film, not a creative, original, unique kind of film, but a regular film is based on variation and repetition. You established a baseline, in our case, how the characters behave in their normal contexts, how their personalities are reflected in the setup, the furniture, props in their homes, how they start their trip in the car, and then you introduce variations to develop the rest of the narrative. I will continue with different scenes, and if there is time, I will also show you those scenes from the Amazon Prime video. So just briefly, when you go to the end of week nine, you find that this week's assignment due as usual by the end of Friday is a film essay and the recommendation, although you don't have to strictly follow that kind of template, is to think about the parameters in the so-called matrix, which, failing anything else, gives you a template you can easily follow. But again, you don't have to do that. Keep in mind, though, the last instruction that you find in here that invites you to focus not exclusively or generically on the theme of feminism. You can certainly treat the, th the theme of feminism. It is uh, essential to the understanding of this film, but try to connect it to the specific structure of this film, this film as a road trip. So what does it mean to combine a road movie with the theme of feminism. The second instruction that you find in here is to include references to at least another movie that we have discussed during the class up to this point. And the most relevant for this kind of comparison would be Detour, The Hitchhiker, or Il Sorpasso, because it's easy to see elements that connect the story or the treatment, the presentation of the characters in any of those movies and in Thelma and Louise. So keep that in mind. Inside the notes, which are one of the required readings, you do find some ideas if you don't know where to start from. You will find some sections that start with compare to, and I've included those films and more. I've included briefly Bonnie and Clyde, also Easy Rider if you're familiar with the film, etc. But for example, compared to The Hitchhiker, you start with the most obvious elements of comparison, right? In both films, the main characters are going fishing, but their fishing trip means something else, right? For Roy and Gilbert, 
it is their first time outside of their family, their first trip as male bodies, their first escape from their duties as husbands and fathers. In the case of Thelma and Louise, it's an escape from two environments, the diner, uh, Thelma's house, which are constrictive, oppressive, right? It's an opportunity to be themselves, right? In both instances, whatever happens is prompted by a deviation that was not planned, right? Roy and Gilbert decide not to go to the Chocolate Mountains. And by the way, even Thelma and Louise are supposed to go to the mountains fishing. They go instead to Mexico. Now, they don't stop in Mexicali to have a drink and perhaps something else. In the case of Thelma and Louise, they do stop at a saloon and their trip takes a change, a dramatic one after that. So keep this in mind. Let me find the starting point. And let me know if you're able to see enough of the details, otherwise we'll lower the shades as well. The images you see during the initial credits are also somewhat reminiscent of two films. One is Detour, because Detour itself uses the same kind of trope of visual commonplace for the initial credits, that is to say, you see the road. And you know that this is a movie, which is a road movie, a movie about being on the road. And also, because of the landscape, you know that being on the road means to escape from civilization, escape from organized society. But based on the nature of the landscape, you can also easily think of similar images that you see in the hitchhiker. Okay, so it is significant that they start with a landscape which is reminiscent in anticipation of the conclusion and how they will fly into the air off of the cliff near the Grand Canyon, but also it establishes a contrast, a different kind of baseline, with the images that will follow. Because you go from this desert, right, landscape with no human presence, with the possibility of the road, with the possibility of freedom, suggested both by the long stretch of dirt road that you see and also by the sky, right, and the clouds, you go from there, and they also play with colors, right? They go from black and white to colors, but look at the kind of palette they have, right? Look at the greens, and especially nowadays, greens are treated horribly by, by digital cameras. Digital cameras struggle with greens and reds, and, and greens pop too much, are too vivid in most films um, these days. I noticed that in a film I watched a couple of, of nights ago, but I've already forgotten the title. Uh, but look at how they keep the light in such a way that even the blue of the sky initially is not a full blue, but is, it, it is reminiscent of the turquoise and light blue colors that you will see on Thelma and Louise, their, their dresses, but then you will see them even in a plaid shirt worn by uh, Brad Pitt when he's being interrogated by the police. You will see them in the jewelry that Louise will give to an old man and barter the jewelry 
with in exchange of is hat. So the colors themselves are significant. Okay. Again, we have more of that fixed, fixated in our mind, and then of course they want to go to dark to establish a transition with the next scene because it is so different, right? And you hear the music, and there you have the first setting. The first character is being presented, and what is the visual style? Now, this is not a French New Wave film, so they're not trying to tell the story without lines. There are plenty of lines. However, it is a good film, and like any good film, they're telling the story not just with the lines or the actions or the gesture made by the actors. They're telling it with the visual details, right? And the details are not significant just one by one, but in the way they create an impression of it. And in here, the impression is clearly of, since you have such a crowded frame, and the following frames, so the camera is on a dolly here, right? You know, the little tracks uh, with the cart that allows to move the camera smoothly, and the camera will just continue to follow her while she moves down, goes to a table over here, then to another table over there. But overall, what you have that fills up your view is lots of people, lots of objects, because the idea of the theme is, is Louise free to express herself? Is Louise fulfilled by her job? And the answer is, of course, that she's oppressed by her job the same way that Thelma is oppressed by her family situation, her husband, her role, her, her diminutive role as just housewife. Okay? And then, even though you just see a waitress serving two tables, the tables themselves will clearly be significant and the people at the table. And one of them will have three generations of women. Grandmother, mother, daughter. So the family, right? The model, the possible life of this character, the life that Louise has not embraced, is the family, right? The continuation of the species. The other table is three, uh, two or three young girls, teenagers or perhaps around 20 years of age, and there the theme is sexual freedom. And you will see how Louise develops the dialogue with them. You've seen it in the scene before. Okay, so we follow Louise. And she's very busy, moving very quickly. But notice how the camera stays still right now, right? And as usual, you have structural elements to mark the frame, in this case, the diagonal line of this uh, uh, panel that separates the area of the kitchen from the area of the customers. But once again, notice how crowded the counter is, right? And how many things all together, everywhere, at every level, wherever you see, you see people and you see objects. And you see the camera is moving, right? Now it's panning, going, following Louise while she's crossing the scene. But once again, the scene is crowded by objects, by people. There are people moving as she is moving, so we know that this is the opposite of freedom, serenity, etc. And we follow her from a distance, right? 
because she's not really the protagonist in this environment, right? She's not exactly in charge of her life through her work as a waitress. And now the camera is moving almost all the way to the other side, and that's the first table again. And now you see clearly, right, instead of seeing more of the dining hall, you see more clearly this group that she is serving. And through the next frames, you can get the sense that they represent a traditional lifestyle, being married uh, and uh, carrying on the species, right? And she will make a, a, a joke about the sausages, right? So <laughs> the joke is out of place. It's not a kind of joke you would uh, do uh, serving uh, these kinds of women, this kind of table. But it's also meaningful because Louise is out of place in that kind of environment because she has not embraced this. And, and we know why, because her life was, was broken by whatever happened to her in um, Texas, right? Serving them and big ones right there the joke and she gets more coffee and then she moves back and the camera moves back from the same position the camera is just moving back and forth on the same line and then using the zoom to capture her oh sorry it was moving back and then you have the younger table which represents another kind of state in a woman's life right they're free to embark in different relationships or just to have sex. And she's trying to connect with them. But you know that she doesn't belong to either table, with either table, right? She doesn't belong with the extended family, with the three generations of women. She doesn't belong with this younger crowd any longer, right? And it makes a joke about sex drive. And then you see another side. And keep in mind, all these frames are separated by just one second. You see another side of her job. This is the kitchen. And again, the kitchen is also crowded with the equipment and also with the colleagues. And once again, the camera will stay fixed or move in this direction and then eventually follow Louise out of this back room into another side of the diner. It could be a bar or looks like a restaurant. It's hard to make up. Okay. <coughs> And once again, you just see through the crowding of the images that Louise is not exactly happy. She's not exactly in command or at the center of her life. And she's calling Thelma, right? And there you have it. That's Thelma's environment. And it's equally crowded in different ways. Lots of furniture, right? Lots of things on the furniture everywhere. And then the most conspicuous element that appears through the various sections of this room, the kitchen and the adjacent uh, small uh, eating area, are the clips. And as I suggested, the clips are, suggest are, are indicative of her dreams, her plans. She's collecting clips because she wants to buy stuff, do stuff with them. And in fact, later on, when the camera moves back to this area to the left, we will see an open door and through the door, we will see a ladder because evidently work has been going on. Either she's working 
according to the script, she is working on the other room or the workers are doing something with the house. So she's trying to be creative, do something with the house, make the house into what her life could have been, but clearly the potential of the character has been squashed by her uh, conventional role assigned to her by her husband, Daryl. Okay, you see books in here, you see something that might be a magazine, might be a catalog, because it's rather thick, as you can see from here. So it could be a catalog where she's buying stuff, right? Remember the script was written in the 1980s, so a, a different kind of social environment. Of course, as usual, you see, you've seen Louise in this part, up to this point in this part of the frame and then moving to this area and you'll see the other character in this space, right? They often do that when there is a phone call. They're not present, but it's like they're looking at each other or occupying different spaces in uh, a series of frames. Now, the camera will move differently in this scene. There will be more a sense of urgency, a sense of agitation. Whereas in the diner, the camera was moving on a dolly. In here, it could be a dolly, could be handheld, but the camera is moving a lot more, trying to keep up with Thelma and also moving closer to her at times. Okay, and again, wherever you point your eyes, you see things that have been attached. You see ways that uh, Thelma is trying to escape her condition, and in a corner you see the images of this game show, some kind of game show, I don't know, it could be uh, Price is Right or, or something similar uh, to it. I haven't uh, explored, I haven't verified what it is. But again, it's a game where you win prizes, right? So it reflects the whole theme of consumption, uh, consumerism, trying to buy things to compensate for a life that is not satisfying. And you see how drastic the changes are, right? right? Look at the angles, look at the TV, and look, one second later, the camera has moved a lot. And then, another second, she's storming through the kitchen. So this gives you a sense of the different pace compared to the diner. Because after all, when you compare Thelma to Louise, Louise seems to be in control. But again, then you learn that she's trying to control not just her environment, her house, which is very neat, but also the demons inside her. That's what she's trying to control, right? Uh, whereas uh, Thelma is more explosive, but also more creative. And, and that's the anticipation of what will happen in the second part of the film, where Thelma will be the most expressive of the two characters and will take the lead spiritually in a way. It will be Thelma saying, I feel a way. Let's not go back. Let's continue, right? And again, no matter where you look at, you see stuff. You see stuff uh, attached to uh, the, the, the cabinets, to the walls, etc. And that's what I was mentioning before. That's the other room with the ladder, with some work that is going on even in the next room. It also gives you a sense of how Thelma's life is incomplete, is a work in progress, right? Because as you know, she uh, will tell Brad Pitt, J JD, later on that she started going out, th that, that Daryl and Thelma went out for four years and eventually got married in 18. So, she started going out with Daryl at 14, got married at 18, so she didn't have a chance 
at creating her own life. And she will, in fact, also mention to JD how Daryl is the only man she's been with. So she hasn't had a chance to experience life. You see back and forth with uh, Thelma, and this time the camera will stay for a few seconds with a fixed angle uh, based on the tiles to the left because you have to provide the baseline for the other part of the scene. Relatively calm in here this time compared to Thelma, and Thelma spinning around the kitchen, going back and forth, eventually serving her husband, helping him with a bracelet, trying to give him coffee, justifying her behavior when he scolds her for hollering. Okay, so you see how compa in, in comparison this scene is less agitated even though people are coming and going. And you go back and once again look at the difference one second makes, look at the corner and look how much the camera has moved. The TV is almost out of the frame within one second. And once again, notice how uh, Thelma is left or center and Louise occupies the other side so that you, you can have this visual representation of a conversation. Right? Even though they're not metaphorically virtually looking at each other. So now, Thelma is moving into this other part of the restaurant and eventually she will move to this aquarium and speak on the phone into the aquarium with intention, right? Because she's not having, it's not like I'm here on the phone in front of something, but I'm not looking at it. She, she will be looking at the fish. And so what does that mean? It's as if, since she's speaking to Thelma, as if Thelma could be understood as a character, as a beautiful fish inside an aquarium. That is to say, a beautiful woman trapped in a situation which looks nice, but it's not satisfying, clearly. Okay? Pretty obvious. Okay, and you see smiling and looking at them and making gestures and back to Thelma and the same kind of agitation rendered by the rapid movement of the camera and we finally now before we see Daryl we see something some evidence that there is a man in the house because finally after all these clips nice pots teapots etc you see a bowling trophy right so you see a masculine prop a reference to a masculine presence and then Daryl will come into the scene right she goes to find him to tell him to hurry up and then go back all the way you see how within three seconds she's outside practically outside of the room calling Daryl and then one two three she's back into the opposite corner of that room the eating area so she's moving very quickly and in fact it seems like the clips themselves are moving as a result right she's going quickly through the air and here he comes okay and now the light is also different there is more light on the bowling bowling trophy and and of course the first thing that he says is god damn it Thomas. and then she says don't hold her like that and and through the rest of the dialogue you understand that she's giving her instruction on what kind of wife she should be what is the script she should follow to greet her husband in the morning 
don't holler, be gentle, be affectionate, be servile, of course. And then look at the finger. And there she is, right? Now, for the first time, we see her in this corner, which we haven't seen before, between the stove and the sink. But this is a new opportunity to use the same space in a new way to profile her as a housewife in the role assigned to her by her husband, Daryl. She moves back, quickly moves to him, and since he is scolding her for her bad behavior, she compensates for it by first, without being asked, going to help him with a bracelet, and then by explaining or justifying her behavior, right? So he's saying you shouldn't call her in the morning, meaning this is what she does and he doesn't want to do that. And then she starts smiling and saying, I'm sorry, doll, I just didn't want you to be late. Of course she's not concerned about him. At this point, from the smile to the line, she's playing the part of the submissive wife, caring, submissive wife, supportive, that he imagines she should be, okay? And now, they're in close proximity, right? However, it's clear, especially from the way you find his hand there, just waiting uh, for the bracelet to be locked, that there is no intimacy, really right, between these two. They are close, but there is no physical intimacy. No evidence of that. And then they move away from each other. And they will remain separate in the rest of the scene, right, into his, at the fridge, she's back towards the sink. And again, this wider shot emphasizing their distance, their separation. And now she's serving coffee, but he's moved away from her, right? And not responding, even with lines, uh-huh. And then just trying to look good and eventually refusing the coffee because this is another way to teach her a lesson. Be cold to her so next time... She learned that it's not enough to give him coffee if she doesn't do it in a loving way, right? I don't want coffee from you if you don't love me the right way. And she looks at him. Now, we know that she's supposed to ask him permission or at least tell him that she's leaving that day to spend the weekend with Louise is still busy with himself and annoyed at her asking question what he says and she chickens out of asking and says do you want anything special for dinner tonight continuing with the role of the nice wife trying to be nice to her husband but again He's not very interested in that, and he will tell her that Friday is very busy, which is just an excuse because he wants to go out with his friends or maybe with a woman. We know from uh, the rest of the script that 4 a.m. Uh, is uh, when he came back or he was not home yet at 4 a.m. the next morning, so he didn't realize she was missing until the next day. She goes back to her corner, right? She has been rejected by him. And she tries uh, to get back at him at this point, right? Saying, oh, that, that's kind of strange that you're so busy every Friday night. And 
Ed, who's trying to be the big man and saying, well, I'm the regional manager, right? And then we see the outside of the house and the camera again will go from one side to the other, from right to left, and eventually stop here where we see a, a, a piece of body acting that is supposed to show there is not much of a man, right? Notice also the license plate, the one, meaning the one for me, the one for Thelma, the only one, right? Not just number one, but the one. And of course, uh, this will be reversed by the rest of the film, but we will see him falling down into the debris, into the various uh, pieces of uh, wood, that the workers are using to, to work on the driveway to ridicule this character even more, although already in the scene in the kitchen he was a caricature of a husband, right? And there he is, falling down and then getting up, great acting, right? Not, not easy to fall like that and to get up in a way that looks natural. And then eventually... He will collect the pieces and drive away after saying, I want you out of here. Okay, And we go back to the rest of the phone call, but uh, let me skip from here, get to something else. Let me get to the point where they leave the house. We'll, we'll skip the packing. The same. So, by this point, we know that there is also a contrast between the two home environments. The bedroom itself, in the case of uh, Thelma, where she is packing for the trip, is full of stuff, stuff that is out of the drawers, and she's packing everything in a very disorganized way. However, there is also a lot of light in that bedroom, in Louise's house, more darkness. And uh, the, the, the shelves, the furniture is not occupied by many objects. There is, in fact, a sense of a lifeless environment, which reflects the uh, inner world of Louise that was killed by the trauma of what happened to her in Texas, right? So, see Louise, and the last shot we see is the sink, and this is one of the places that will be visited by Hal. Hal Slocum will go to her house by himself, not with the other cops. He will go by himself and look around. We will see the shot of the sink. We will see other places, other corners, because that will be how entering not just Louise's house to confirm she is a suspect, but him, how entering Louise's mind, Louise's inner world. And this is the house again. And now Louise is about to leave the house. Like in many other road movies, she will never go back to the house. So essentially she is moving out. And the scene has to confirm that. Of course, cannot be too evident, but has to be somewhat evident she's moving out forever. Okay? So let's see what the frames will tell us. You see Louise coming. The garage opens. We see Thelma dressed quite differently compared to the previous scenes, ready to start her vacation, which is also a way for her to be free and express herself, right? And the baseline is clear, right? In, in here, you will see both of them uh, with scarves, we'll see them with sunglasses, well-dressed. Later on, when on the run, you will not see the scarves anymore. You will see their air flying, right? Moved by the wind you will see less makeup on them because it's a different 
set of circumstances where you will find them later on. But this is the baseline. So the baseline is order, cleanliness, um, beauty, fashion, etc. In the background, you see a mother and a kid going by. Remember that even Thelma doesn't have any kids, right? So in a way, she's married, but she's not a family woman, okay? And this is Thelma coming out of the garage. You start seeing how much stuff she has. She has one big suitcase, one small bag, and, and several other containers, the lantern, the fishing equipment, right? You see this, this extraordinary amount of stuff, so you start to get in the sense that she's moving out, right? And Louise comes out, and of course, keep in mind, you have a, a, a crew, not, not a small skeleton crew of, of 15 people, like in the case of Tulane Blacktop. You have 100 or 200 people, you have a screen, script of 120, 140 pages, and they study that for months, and each one makes suggestion for their own uh, part. Of course, how would you dress them? Selma is dressed like a happy, uh, uh, modest uh, wife, right? And in a dress, and Louise, who initially will be the character in control, the character who makes the decision, the character to whom Thelma will ask permission to do this or that. Can we stop at the saloon? Can we do this? Or later, after the murder, shall, shall we call Daryl? Shall we call Jimmy? See if the man has something to tell us about what to do. She has pants, okay? A good choice and boots, right? Uh, as opposed to the open shoes worn by Thelma. So she goes there to help her, right? Because it is Louise, in a way, moving her out of the house with this idea of the trip. And they go back to the car, and they pack the car to the brim, put everything in there. And, but you see that even though Thelma was loaded with stuff that was not enough, and look how much stuff Louise herself is carrying, right? The second bag is almost as big as the first one, and they're supposed to spend two nights away and more fishing stuff. Okay, so they place everything in the car. And, and of course, the frame is fixed angle, but the car is the baseline for the frame, right? The, the open trunk and the car itself, because the car is their next place right? She leaves the house and she will be on the run. It's like she's moving her stuff from one place to be, the house, and to another place to be, which is the car and being on the run. Notice that they only, they, they show only a couple of places where they sleep. They don't give much relevance to other uh, places, to the motels. Okay? And she's closing and living, and of course they're happy and stylish. You see, having seen the characters, characters such as Louise in her environment with her waitress uniform, uh, submerged, overwhelmed by noise, by people, here you see a different version, right? The baseline was established before, and now you can appreciate the difference uh, in this kind of shot. And before they leave, they will take a picture with their color camera, right? They will take a Polaroid picture that develops almost instantly. Because this is to mark the beginning of their new life, right? There you have selfie from the 1980s. And the light to... to make this into a picture, and of course, it's happiness, it's freedom, it's a sense that wherever they're going, it's different from the diner and the house for Louise, the house and the family, the relationship with the husband for Thelma. And following that, 
you see them, again, I'm going through the frames one per second, you see them emerge from this slope, right? The car is slowly coming into view because really this is a simple way and, and there are many ways to do that in a film to show how the characters are now entering a new stage in their life. So the characters are emerging from nothing, right? You see the asphalt and then you see them coming out because this is the real beginning. Before it was just a premise. Now they're coming into the frame as protagonists of a new story, which is not the story of Louise's job or Thelma's relationship. However, for the first time, and then it'll become almost boring to notice, you see them and you see a truck. And between now and the saloon especially, you will see a lot of tracks because even when they're on the road, the road is another place inhabited mostly by men. And how, what's a visual way to show that the road is full of men, more men and women on the road? Tracks, right? Because you think a track and you think that the vast majority of the truck drivers are men. Okay, so you see a track, something like an ice cream truck, but it's still a track, it's still driven by a man. So they're very happy, they're on the road, they're ca the car is coming to the center of the frame, but they're not completely free, right? They're followed, they're surrounded by men. And in fact, you even see the car driving out of the frame to give more evidence to the track for a moment. And then the next uh, sequence will be with a camera, clearly a camera that was put on a structure, they, they put some kind of structure on this side of the car, right? They do it all the time. And uh, the camera is fixed. You see this. And of course, this is a part of the window of a car that has virtually disappeared, but was very common until that time. When it was introduced in the 1930s, this was called the wind wing because before cars had air conditioning, you would not th bring down the whole glass because the whole window, because there would be too much air. You would just open this corner, just change it, and the wind would enter and go your way and refresh you, okay? So it will remain like that for a lot of frames, and you see mostly the close-ups of their faces, but through the scene, they're not only talking, but getting ready. So uh, um, Thelma is finishing her preparation, and then you'll see her putting on sunglasses, eventually getting a cigarette, pretending to be Louise. And you think, clearly you think of something like the interaction between Roberto and Bruno, and how Roberto is looking up to Bruno the same way the Thelma is looking up to Louise as a model, as someone who has embraced a different kind of lifestyle, and maybe it could be an alternative to be pursued by her as well. There are other things you notice, of course, they're just driving and, and the director let the light, whatever light catches them, but it works very well with their conversation. There's other, the, the alternance between shade and light, especially you see the light through the uh, air of, of Thelma and, and that emphasizes the light even more. You see light, shade, and then a little bit of light again, and then a lot of light again within seconds. And of course, notice the way the... the eh, stereotypically feminine way that Thelma handles the gun and gives it to Louise because Louise is the adult. Louise is the person who's in control, uh, who's responsible, etc. But even though the gun is being handled like that, you have a gun in the story. So they're playing with you by showing it handled in a way that you wouldn't imagine a uh, woman using it 
but they will. And same alternance between light and shade. But notice how, if you look at the frame of the car, the camera keeps the same angle through the entire scene. Now she has sunglasses on and she will, however, because the next thing that will happen that is uh, a twist in the story is stopping at the saloon and Thelma flirting with Harlan, who will eventually try to rape her, beat her up and get killed, she's taking off her jacket. So at this point, she's not the modestly dressed uh, wifey, small wife, uh, little wife that uh, we uh, thought she would be when she came out of the house. Now she's showing more skin. And later, she will get into a pose, putting her feet on the dashboard, that is more physical, right? That points to the body. So this is in preparation with the decision to stop at the saloon and engage in activities that could lead to sex, right? Let me continue for just a minute. Right? You see her taking off her jeans jacket. They're looking around, she's saying, I've never been out of town without Daryl, which is again reminiscent of what uh, Gilbert will say, uh, I've never been uh, out for a trip without my family since the war, right? And you know the significance uh, of this. And now, now that you've seen her disrobe and ready then to attract the attention of other men, now you see the expression on her face while she's saying, I didn't tell you. I've done this. This is my act of rebellion. And, and all of this is conducive to what will happen in the saloon. 